Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I, on behalf of New York University, our president, John Sexton, the Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, Dean Ellen Shaw, and the Wagner Policy Alliance, the entire university community welcomes you to today's event in Skirball Center. You are in for a treat. NYU, as you know, is very proud to be a frequent convener and research leader of major policy issues and disciplines and regions around the world. We are a global network university with 45,000 students, 10 overseas campuses, and portal campuses in Abu Dhabi and New York, and one to come in Shanghai. We are rooted in New York, deeply connected with its businesses, industries, and fields, and politics. And today we have a special treat with this tremendous opportunity to hear three of the most esteemed political commentators, journalists, and strategists on campaign 2012. NYU's Graduate School of Public Service at Wagner and its Wagner Policy Alliance here has brought together an extraordinary team. We really want to welcome with extreme enthusiasm our moderator today, George Stephanopoulos, and the speakers, Mr. Steve Schmidt and Mr. Robert Schrum. First, first I'll introduce to Steve Schmidt. He is currently Vice Chairman for Public Affairs at Edelman. He served as Senior Advisor for the John McCain Presidential Campaign in 2008. He was Campaign Manager for the successful 2006 re-election campaign of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in California. And he worked on George W. Bush's 2004 re-election campaign. He also, I would note, started his life in politics as an eight-year-old leafleting for Senator Bill Bradley in his home state of New Jersey. Then he switched gears to the Republican side. <laughs> we also have uh, Bob Schrum. Robert Schrum is one of the most influential Democratic political strategists and media experts uh, for the last four decades, beginning in 1972 with George McGovern as a principal speechwriter, through many years working closely with Senator Edward Kennedy as his principal speechwriter and close advisor and confidant. He also was the key key strategist for both Gore 2000 and Kerry 2004. His best-selling book, No Excuses, Confessions, Concession, sorry, of a Serial Campaigner, was a bestseller. And he's with Wagner as a senior fellow and clinical professor. And finally, our very esteemed and distinguished moderator, who needs probably the quickest introduction of all because you've seen him so long and so often in so many wonderful forums politically. He's been active in the ABC News world since 2002 when he was named the host of This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Then he became the anchor for Good Morning America. And then this January, he agreed to come back as the host of This Week. So he's doing two shows for the ABC network as it's, and is also serving as its chief political correspondent. We should give him a special hand because tomorrow is his birthday. So. <laughs> So please, please welcome these distinguished speakers, knowledgeable and insiders in, in politics and the media as we talk about the campaign 2012. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. So please much. Go. Thank you. And what a great, what a great week to be here. You actually left out that Steve is being played by Woody Harrelson in the upcoming movie Game Change on HBO. <laughs> Um, and I do want to start with you, Steve, because this is, this is some week, okay? You were obviously campaign manager for John McCain last time around. Put yourself in the shoes of Matt Rhodes, who is Mitt Romney's campaign manager Tuesday night when he finds out that Romney has lost not only uh, Minnesota, not only Missouri, but also Colorado, that he expected to win. So a clean sweep for Rick Santorum. Uh, what is he thinking? How surprised were they? You say, I have a lot of affection for Matt. I worked with him for a long time. Um, I think Tuesday night, you, you sit there, you always hope on these things that you win it the easy way, but you almost never do. So I think the realization on Tuesday night is that this is going to be a long, hard slog. It's going to go a, a long distance. And you sit there, and it probably takes some time to realize that you are out there saying that, look, we're the inevitable nominee. We're going to be it. We're going to we're going to win. Everyone should get aboard. But you've just finished the eighth contest. Someone else has won four. You've won three. 
So it's a big problem. It, it is, and it's funny. You actually used the words. When I was talking to uh, Matt earlier this week, he quoted uh, Ringo Starr, you know it don't come easy. And he said basically uh, the same thing. But th there's been a, this is kind of a, a problem that is, uh, or a condition that we've seen, a paradox all year long in this Republican campaign. Mitt Romney has been both the inevitable nominee and every single week an incredibly weak nominee. What's that about? Well, we were talking backstage about the 2008 Democratic contest. Um, and it was different because at the end of that contest, uh, Senator Obama was stronger for it. Uh, but so, so, so would have been Senator Clinton. And, and the reality is, in 2008, Democrats wanted both of them. Uh, but right. they could only have one of them. Uh, in 2012, Republicans want none of them but are going to be stuck with one of them. And so you see that playing out on a, on a weekly basis, where even after Florida, you had 40% of Republican voters wanted somebody else uh, in the race. And that's not going to happen. But the somebody else in the race uh, is clearly Rick Santorum, who is a plausible uh, nominee of the party. Uh, he has the background necessary to be considered seriously. We had a lot of candidates in the earlier part of the race who most of them are gone now, but were not plausible as Herman presidential Kane. candidates and, 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 and some. And, and some of the reality <laughs> show contestants who have flirted in and out uh, you know, over, over, over the course of it. But uh, you know, I think people are giving Rick Santorum a look now. And the issue matrix has changed with the intrusion uh, very quickly, very suddenly, very unexpectedly of a whole range of social issues which really accrue in a Republican primary to his benefit. I think that's exactly right. Meanwhile, Bob, all year long, the White House has been planning for Mitt Romney, uh, Mitt Romney uh, nominee, uh, hoping, I think, at times that Newt Gingrich might overtake him. But that's still what they're expecting. Still what you expect? Oh, sure. I, I think... I think it's almost inconceivable that anybody else wins the nomination. But I'll tell you, there, there is a warning sign, and I went and looked, and you'll remember one of these. I mean, in the 1992, uh, and the primary schedule was different because Iowa really wasn't part of it. We hadn't even had it, it yet, yeah. most of it. Right, but, but several weeks after Georgia, you had like, what, 60% of Democrats said they, were, they wanted Bill Clinton. I mean, he sort of won the early process. And it went on for a while, but everybody knew Got what beating was... Colorado, much like Ronnie right. did, but he kept... But he, didn't but, keep but, but he was the choice of the party, it was clear. In 2004, two weeks after Iowa, uh, Kerry was the choice of 60, 65 percent of Democrats. He wrapped it up very early. Yeah. But there was, there's a natural consolidation that occurs, and what's happening here is unnatural. Now, all of us say, who've been around this, it can't be any of these other people. Can't even be Rick Santorum because while he benefits from the social issues in the primary, I think that and Steve and I were talking about this yesterday. The spectacle of 60-year-old men running around campaigning against birth control probably isn't a big seller in the general election. Uh, uh, so, so, but Romney, it, it, Romney does have to win. You know, he he's got to win Michigan. He's got to win Arizona. If he loses either of those. Then I think you go to another big contest. Now he has the resources, he has the structure, and in the end, I think he's going to well, win just, a you, very begrudged nomination. I, I, I agree with that, and I think he's almost certainly the nominee. But you brought up an important point. If Rick Santorum beats him in Michigan, say, you know, one of his home, one of Mitt Romney's home states, I suppose, and I'll ask you both this, I suppose Mitt Romney could still and will still grind it out, but that is kind of a mortal blow. It would be a huge deal, and the narrative would be campaign and collapse. Um, I'm not sure at that point that he is, you know, even as you just described it, you're through the process that, that he's the nominee of the party. Um, if he loses that If he one. loses Michigan, uh, if he loses Arizona. Just as if is, Newt had beat him in Florida, he might not have been the nominee. He might not have been, but I, but I do think Santorum doesn't have the baggage that a Gingrich has. I think you look at his record, you look at the fact that he lost by a bigger margin than any U.S. senator since 1980 in an important swing state, Pennsylvania, in 2006, that uh, you look at his book, you look at the fact that 53% of the electorate is going to be women, you need to win suburban women in key states, and you look at a number of his different issue positions, 
And I think he has a, a big problem appealing to the middle in a, in a general well, and, and this gets to the other problem that he has coming out of Tuesday night, Bob. Uh, the White House, uh, they're being cautious, but I, they, they're coming off really as the best week in, in months. You've got good economic news coming out with the unemployment numbers. We had a new poll out at the beginning of the week showing the president opening up for the first time a clear lead over Mitt Romney. And then to Steve's point, to Steve's couple of points about this primary process, it's also showing that the longer this process goes on, the more independents are turned off to Mitt Romney. He's got an 18-point deficit among favorability among independents right now. The president is actually at the same place with independents that he was when he beat John McCain four years ago. Yeah, I think the economy is helping, but, but I think you're absolutely right about the toll the primary process is exacting. First, it pushed Romney to the right, further right than he wanted to go, I'm sure. Uh, secondly, it's raised fundamental issues about his character. And I think they've come through to people. You know, does this guy really believe in anything? I mean, everybody changes a position or, or you know, fudges a line, but that's an episode for most candidates. For him, it seems to be an epidemic. Uh, and then he's become a gaffe machine who, I don't think he's a very good politi natural pol political campaigner. He's become a kind of gaffe machine who goes out there and says things that reinforce the notion that he's not only rich, it's fine to be rich, FDR was rich, the JFK was rich, people thought they cared about ordinary people. He reinforces the impression that he's out of touch and doesn't care. And it feels like, and I don't want to bring up a sore subject, but it feels like the Obama White House is going to try to run a campaign similar to what uh, George W. Bush ran against John Kerry. Uh, in, in 2004, you know. That is a sore subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you, uh, the, and it's, Steve and I have talked about this. The, the initial flip-flop argument against Kerry, uh, at least in our data, wasn't going anywhere. It said, you know, he was, uh, he voted for the authorization for the Iraq war and he'd been against the Gulf War and people were, I think most people said, you know, two different situations, 12 years apart. I don't understand what they're saying. And then he went, and the Bush campaign did a brilliant thing. He went to this veterans event in West Virginia, and the Bush campaign ran some ads saying that he had voted against the $87 billion supplemental for uh, uh, Iraq. He is very, very sensitive to veterans who have been a big cause of his forever and to troops in the field. So for once in his life, John was not nuanced, he was not complicated, which would have served him very well, because there's a perfectly defensible explanation, which was, I wanted, I wanted this $87 billion, but I wanted it paid for, and I wanted to set benchmarks. Instead, he said, look at this guy who'd seen these Bush ads and asked a question, I voted for the $87 billion before I voted against it. That's what made the flip-flop argument work. Because on the whole, Kerry was, had a pretty consistent record which Romney does not. Now, one other thing I would take out of that is it was indelible. I mean, when, when Mary Beth Cahill came and got me and said, you gotta, you gotta look at this, I thought, oh my God, we'll never get away Well, that's why I this. want to bring you back to Steve. We're gonna get back to this campaign in a second, but this is kind of fascinating insight into how campaigns work. I'm sure you had your TVs going that day. You see it happen, what happens? Well, I said we got them, you know, that we had had a lot of difficulty um, really pressing the issue. And the issue was that a couple weeks before, John Kerry had said under no circumstances would he ever vote against the supplemental because it was for uh, ammunition, body armor, et cetera, et cetera. In the meantime, Howard Dean had made it to the covers of Time and New Newsweek and US News and World Report. He was surging. John Kerry made the vote. And John Kerry was attacking the administration, uh, attacking the president for uh, sending troops into harm's way, lacking equipment, and we just could not, uh, you know, argue this to the press that this was a legitimate issue, that he was being hypocritical, and we needed to come up with a tactic. And the tactic was to place TV ads in West Virginia under the hope that someone would ask them that people, if they wouldn't cover the issue, they would cover the political tactic, the ad. And, uh, you know, he did it, and uh, the only network that ran it that night uh, was Fox News. And we're watching the 6 o'clock Fox News, and this became the most decisive moment in the campaign. And uh, it was up in the bank of TVs, and you just said, I voted for it before I voted against it. We all understood, you know, really quickly, you know, the, you know, the power of that. And then, um, you know, four years later, 
I, I got the other side of it when John McCain said after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the fundamentals of the economy is strong. <laughs> right. I, you know, had, had, had exactly the same reaction that I had four years earlier, except the opposite. <laughs> so Bob, switch hats for a second. Uh, Pretend for a minute you are a Republican strategist and you're for, for, for Romney's campaign. How does he deal with his double bind he's in right now? Uh, trying to make sure he's not outflanked on the right while trying to preserve his viability in a general election with the center, with independents. How do you navigate that in the next few weeks? You know, I don't think he can go further to the right. I think if he goes further to the right, takes more right-wing positions, stands again with Donald Trump or does something like that, which I think that hurt him, by the way, this week, along with the, the statement. Do you think that hurt him? Oh, I think the Trump thing hurt him. I think it looked ridiculous. It, looked, it convinced people, again, that this guy would do or say anything. Uh, I think he needs to find, uh, and maybe Steve could identify it, an issue position where you know, he has a little bit of a sister soldier moment. Uh, Trump would have been great. He could have said, Trump's offered to endorse me. I don't want his endorsement. Hmm. Uh, I don't think he's a serious person in the politics of the country. They didn't do that because they were worried Trump would go out and run as a third-party candidate. Well, that's a pretty good reason to worry, thing yeah. to worry about, but, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. So maybe, maybe I, but still, I, I mean, I never saw a worse visual tableau than that endorsement in politics. <laughs> Ann Romney looked so uncomfortable, it was unbelievable. <laughs> It looked like Gordon Gecko standing next to a Ken doll, with, ne <laughs> when, with neither of them liking each other. So uh, look, I'm not. I'm. I'm trying to. Be, I think Romney is the strongest or the least weak of a weak Republican field to run against the president. But he's got to get out there. He's got to get beyond his bio. Uh, and I'm a CEO, and I know how to fix the economy, which may be being fixed as we speak. Uh, and he's got to present a couple big ideas that he's going to stand for and fight for. And one, that, that doesn't one of them have to be, Steve. Um, he's got to come out for some kind of major tax reform. I mean, the Wall Street Journal editorial board has said this, but I think he, you can see he's got, he's got a real problem. One, this idea of a big idea. Secondly, in our poll, even though voters by about four to one like his business experience, two-thirds of voters right now think he doesn't pay his fair share of taxes. So I wonder if one of the... Uh, one of the sister soldier moments might be coming out against you know, the carried interest tax breaks that hedge funds investment managers get. Doesn't he have to do something to put himself on the side of average Americans there? It's a terrible fight for Republicans is to be in defense of the carried interest loophole and in defending you know, very narrow bands of the tax code is that Republicans in general have to go out and say that this entire system has been corrupted is that if you want to do something about the influence of special interests in Washington, the number one thing you can do is not ban lobbyists from the campaign or where they can sit in the White House. It's to reform the tax code because that's what they all exist to lobby on at the end of the day. So big, bold proposals to move the country forward, fundamental reform proposals, I think on issues of energy policy, on tax reform, you know, on spending reduction, the country $16 trillion in debt, the impact that that will have on the lives of all of these young people out here today you know, is almost beyond the ability to communicate. Uh, enormous challenges that the country faces, and so far it's been a fairly small ball campaign. Uh, the strategy of the campaign has been when one of the opponents rises up to squash them like a bug. I think that and it's that, worked. And it works. And, and I think there's no sympathy for Newt Gingrich in the, in the Republican Party. There was you know, a lot of glee, I think, from a lot of people watching him, watching him get it. I think it's going to be interesting to see the reaction in the party when it occurs to Rick Santorum, because there may well be a backlash. And you have, whether it's from the National Review, from the Weekly Standard, from the Wall Street Journal, all the important intellectual organs of the Republican Party have been quite critical on the lack of a robust uh, policy agenda you know, for him that moves the country forward. And, and, and I think it's a tough spot for him. It is, and be, because I think, Bob, up until the last couple of weeks when, you, when it seemed like more of an economic recovery was taking hold, and who knows, it could still go right. south in the spring, the argument that President Obama stifled the recovery, made it worse, had some traction. Sure, and you could see in, in your poll uh, the change in his favorability, the improvement, although he's still only at 44%, I think, 
on the economy. I mean, it was a the much better number, yeah. the president, much better number than it was before. Uh, it's really tough to have a one-dimensional campaign that depends on circumstances, because then you don't have any control over your own fate, because circumstances can turn, circumstances can change. Uh, and I think Romney's problem is, I mean, I, I think coming out against the carried interest deduction and a real tax reform would be very good. I think a lot of people around him are going to say, you can't do that, we're getting our money, and our super PAC's getting its money from all these hedge fund folks. They're going to be upset. So I, I don't know where he's going to find the big idea. He's going to give an economic speech, apparently, in Detroit. In Detroit, Detroit Economic Club, standard. Yeah, yeah. But, he's, but he's going to have to say something. I mean, he has a 59-point economic plan, and my rule of thumb would be a 59-point economic plan is a non-existent economic plan. <laughs> okay, right. I was I always wondered why they came up with 59, not 60 <laughs> or 50. But, um, you know, Bob was making fun of the Donald Trump uh, endorsement, and, and everything he said about the awkwardness of the event is true. On the other hand, I, I ended up thinking it was, on the margins, the right thing for Romney to do because of this potential third-party challenge, which is one of the things that could make sure he doesn't win if he does indeed get the nomination. And, and we, should, we should talk about this for a minute because the table really is set. If there were any year when you were going to see a third-party candidate take hold, it would be this year. You've got majority of Americans say they want to see one. You've got record low approval ratings basically for each party. Congress, forget about it. They're now 10 percent. That's lower than Nixon uh, in, in Watergate. How, how viable is it this year? Do you put much stock in this uh, group that is now organized Americans elect to, to put someone up on the internet? Do you think it'll be a factor in the general election? It could be if they get ballot access in all 50 states. Americans and, elect and, says they're going to do it. It looks like they're, it looks like they're going to do it. And somebody gets on the ballot who's going to pull a couple of points away from the Republican candidate. Uh, you know, the reality is in, in 2000 that, you know, but for Ralph Nader, Al Gore would have been president of the, of the United States. That's so true. It doesn't, no question, right? It, no, doesn't, no question. it doesn't, it doesn't take Unless, much. Unless, as Pat Buchanan once said to me, you think that there are 18,000 Jewish voters on the Gold Coast of Florida <laughs> who were really anxious to vote for him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I, uh, and, <laughs> and I, um, you know, so I, I think, um, you know, as you, as you look it out, I, I would say this on the, on the Donald Trump endorsement, is that the, the fundamental critique on, on, on Mitt Romney's character critique is that he will say anything to anyone at any time to advance his political interests. And so the tableau looked like a hostage video, uh, you know, with, <laughs> right. with them standing up there. I, you know, pictures don't lie. They looked really uncomfortable. Uh, at a, you know, at a, you know, this is Donald Trump, you know, with the flirtation with birtherism, you know, which is an effort to delegitimize uh, the president and the presidency, and in fact, it's an attack on the system because the system requires that both sides grant each other legitimacy and in, in victory. So I, I think it's as, 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 as a toxic a, a, a thing that's out there. I think Donald Trump is a clown. Most of the American people think he's a clown. Um, the meatloaf endorsement, which may have come with it, you know, put it aside. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, it was an opportunity to get up there and show presidential timber and character and strength, that it was a missed opportunity. I think they viewed it transactionally, and it was a mistake. And, and Bob, in the White House right now, as we've talked about, they've had a bit of a, a, a good run here for the last couple of weeks. Setting aside, you know, European debt, uh, crisis again that, that drives us back into a recession or slow growth. What should they be most worried about politically right now? Uh, that they're going to, that the president's going to say or do something that makes him look entirely disconnected again. I mean, we all lived through a moment like that when at the fundraiser in San Francisco in 2008, he said people are bitter in these states like Pennsylvania and they cling to God and their guns. Uh, I think that they have to be very careful about that. I, I, my guess is that, that Obama is very disciplined now and that he would not say anything like that even mm -hmm. in, in, in private. Uh, and I, I think they have to be a little bit worried about the debates. And I'll tell why? you why. The expectations for Romney are going down, down, down. Even though he had several good debates. Yeah, but he always, he has several good debates and then he says, I'll bet you $10,000. <laughs> <Right. laughs> or I don't care about very, very poor, poor people. people. Or, I, you know, I'm unemployed just like you. So, they, <laughs> he is, he, but he is capable 
when he is carefully coached and stays in his message box, he's capable of doing very well. Absolutely. And uh, so I think his expectations will be low and the president's expectations will be very high. So that, that's one thing I think that could help turn it around. The, one, the, the other quality in Romney, and I saw this in 1994 when I was doing Senator Kennedy's campaign for re-election against Mitt Romney, and he kept demanding a debate and demanding a debate and demanding a debate, and by then, we'd run all these worker ads from Bain and then moved out to a 12 or 15 point lead, and uh, Romney would say we were ducking a debate. He was right, we were. And then the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald got together and we had no choice but to debate. And the expectation was that Romney was really gonna do Kennedy in. Uh, and the exact opposite happened. And, and one thing about him is, if he gets a challenge he doesn't expect or a question he doesn't expect, uh, he can be very brittle, uh, he can react kind of badly and he can say the wrong thing. I mean, Kennedy looked at him in the debate and said, you know, you're not, you're not pro-choice, you're multiple choice. <laughs> and and Romney, Romney looked at him and said, that was uncalled for, well, the, Senator. You know, yeah, the, the one thing I don't understand, actually, maybe you have some insight into all this, Romney probably had the best debates of the campaign in Florida, mm -hmm. going into Florida with the help of Michelle Bachman's uh, debate coach, Brett O'Donnell, and then we find out five days later, basically fired. What was that about? Um, I don't know. I, you, read the, you read the accounts of it, you know, uh, campaigns react negatively sometimes when people are fronted, they're in the paper, they're out there doing uh, interviews. You know, candidates a lot of time have big egos and, uh, you know, other people in the campaign and, you know, but it's clear, and, and I like Brett and, you know, he worked for Senator McCain, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's clear that, you know, there was some internal politics there and, you know, he wound up on the outside of the tent, and it happens in campaigns. George, say, could I have one thing about that? Because, yeah. and you'll know this too. I think really successful politicians and leaders give credit; they don't hoard credit for themselves. I mean, Ronald Reagan used to say, "I don't really care who gets the credit as long as I get the thing done." Uh, Senator Kennedy was forever giving credit to people and building an extraordinarily loyal team of people. And Bill Clinton could be very generous mm -hmm. about giving credit to people. I think it's a weakness in either Romney or his campaign operation, and I don't know which one did it, that this guy who's, by the way, a very successful college debate coach, he made Liberty University a real power in terms of college debate, that this guy gets two lines in the New York Times and they fire him. That's a brittle campaign. It felt like a bit of an overreaction to me. In some ways, it felt like he was, they were trying to send a message to everyone else in the Romney universe even more than, than to Brett O'Donnell. But let me pick up on the question I asked Bob about the vulnerabilities the president faces. He's been having a tough time, White House having a tough time this week with this decision okay. to include Catholic hospitals and universities in this mandate that in, insurance has to provide. Uh, contraception services did not have an exemption uh, for Catholic hospitals, clearly a division inside the White House staff mm -hmm. on, this, on this question. It's created a huge backlash. It looks like the, the White House is going to um, compromise a bit in the face of the criticism. How damaging is this in, in, in some of the states the president needs to carry? Um, it's probably not damaging in the long term because the White House is going to backtrack <clears throat> off of this They're decision. You see huge divisions in the Democratic Party. And it really unites all Republicans, uh, even, you know, from my wing of the party, which, you know, the, the pro-gay marriage, you know, wing of the party, you know, where I have a number of apostate, you know, a uh, number of apostate positions from the, you know, orthodoxy of, of today's Republican Party. And that, you, you had a fracturing in the Republican Party, I think, on the issue of Terry Schiavo in, in 2006, where you have traditionalists in the Republican Party who are able to find common cause with the religious right among Republicans. So if you want to put the Virgin Mary statue in the publicly funded art museum and, you know, cover it in dog manure, you know what, I'm with you, Pat Robertson. I, I'm against the taxpayer funding. You want to pull down the Ten Commandments that have been above the courthouse, you know, for 150 years, you know, I'm with you. I, I, leave them alone. It's as it's much a historical artifact as anything else. You want to have an act of Congress to intervene in a state court decision, an end-of-life family decision, can't be there with you. It's a, it's a huge overreach. So on the Republican side, universally, we all look at this 
as a big government encroachment on an issue of religious liberty and conscience and are against it, and I think a lot of Democrats are there. The problem for the issue is that to the extent that Republicans talk about, as Bob referenced earlier, this will over time become an issue, remember, not for the attack on religious liberty that I think is embedded on it. It will be a bunch of overreaching Republicans Ford in their 60s talking about <laughs> contraception. And any time that you have 60-year-old white men with an R next to their name talking about contraception, it is not good for the Republican Party in the context of a general election. So you think there's just as much danger for the Republicans for, as for President Obama? Every right benefit, now. everybody benefits from the issue going away as quickly as possible. Steve mentioned he's, he's part of the small but perhaps growing wing in the Republican Party who are coming out, uh, at least live and let live on gay marriage at the least. The president has been walking a, a, a very fine line now for several years where he started out being uh, against gay marriage, probably for it many, many years ago, against it since he was clearly running for president, sending all kinds of signals that he's uncomfortable with his uh, opposition to gay marriage, yet not crossing the line and saying he's no longer opposed to it. The, the question clearly coming to the Supreme Court uh, by next spring, do you think he will affirmatively say, I am for gay marriage before the election? Would it be advisable? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, in 2004, when this question arose, uh, the Kerry campaign formulated a position. We were for civil unions. We weren't for marriage. Yeah. Uh, Kerry was very frustrated with it. I mean, he would look at me and we'd be driving somewhere, flying somewhere. He'd say, okay, explain to me once again, what's the real difference between my position and marriage? Uh, and uh, that same position was taken by Obama in 2008. Uh, it appears to me that they think it is safer to stay there while signaling their discomfort his discomfort with it. But he's also managed some major gains for the gay and lesbian community that I think don't take away the pressure to move on this. They give him uh, some space. But they give him space. I mean, look, gays in the military, I mean, it's one, of the, it's one of the biggest social changes in some ways, and yet it went off without a hitch. The Marine Corps, apparently, which was worried about it, says no problems at all. Uh, so I think he's, he's bought himself some space. Ultimately, I think that we'll look back on this 30 or 40 years from now, the way we look on miscegenation laws, uh, and say, how could anybody have been against this? And he's not against it. He's just but, not but, for but it. Do you, do, you, do you believe, uh, and I guess I could see how it could hurt him simply because it's a shift in the middle of a campaign. I could see that. But do you believe the sentiment is so strongly against it right now no. that it would actually be a negative no? No. I, I, and, and, and actually, I believe most of the, the, the Democrats he's going to lose in places like West Virginia, which he's not going to carry, uh, uh, wouldn't vote for him anyway. What's your take on what would happen if he changed in the campaign? I think that um, it would be a big historic moment, and uh, he would write himself into the history books in a fundamentally good way. I think there's very little political consequence yep. to it. And I think you see this playing out, for example, with the million moms against Ellen. Uh, right. Most decent people are on Ellen's side because she's a decent person uh, who's being smeared by a lot of indecent people. It'd be interesting to see how that, uh, that you, you bring up Admiral Mullen had that exact reaction when he firmly testified right. before the Congress that I am for gays in the military. Why don't we open it up? Right now, it's, it's hard not to see all your faces, so it'd be great to hear, see your faces and hear some of your questions uh, as well. Um, this is for all of you. How much do you feel that religion is imposing itself upon these campaigns? I, or do you feel? Well, I, 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 was, I teach uh, a group called the Crown Prince Scholars from Abu Dhabi. It's part of NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, the, a course on American democracy, and I wasn't going to get up there and say there are three branches of government and all that hoo-ha. <coughs> so we teach presidential, I teach presidential elections. And I start with 60 because we have the film. And 
it's really remarkable when you watch Kennedy's speech to the Houston Ministerial Association how far we've deviated from that. You know, I believe in an America where no Catholic prelate and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners how to vote and where none of them would try to tell a president of the United States how to act on public policy. We've moved a long way from that. Uh, and to a certain extent, I think, uh, as a sometime Catholic, the church has, a, as, well, it's been harder the last few years. Uh, the, the church has an obligation to bear witness to, it, to what it believes. Uh, but we're getting to the point where basically churches are becoming political lobbying groups on their specific issues. I mean, why, for example, look, take the contraception thing. And I, George and I both have some acquaintance with Georgetown University. Apparently, for years, Georgetown has provided the choice of an insurance policy that covered contraception to its employees. And it has lots of non-Catholic students and lots of non-Catholic teachers. Uh, so now they're, what's going to happen, I suspect, is they're going to yeah. get a call from the archbishop who's going to tell them you they can't could, do this. They could, although Georgetown would argue they're not the same as Catholic University, which is actually run by the church, and so they can have different rules. But yeah, I take your point on that. Oh. Um, it, I've actually been quite surprised by um, how little uh, the issue of, of, of Mitt Romney's Mormonism, what, how little a role that seems to have played so far in this, in this election. You know, he gave a, a Kennedy-like speech last time around, and he seems to have stuck to it, and he seems to have bought himself some space uh, on that issue. You know, we, we, but to pick up on, on Bob's point, I, I think it is, um, we, we seem to want to have our candidates convince us that they are people of faith, and for the most part, once they're actually president, we don't necessarily want them to act on it, although when they're working through the primaries, there's a lot more pressure to do that. Um, in the Republican Party, there is a belief amongst a lot of people who aspire to be president. The part of the process of running for president is to go and seek favor with a bunch of these nutty pastors who say things like, uh, Katrina can be explained because of the gay pride parade that took place in <laughs> New Orleans and so on and so forth. So to the extent that people go and kowtow and seek favor with people who have extreme views like that, I think that it just scares people to death. Well, that caused trouble and, for Rick Perry though, right, this time around. That caused trouble for Rick Perry. I think it scares people to death in the context of a general election particularly in the demographics that Republicans need to compete in successfully to win, uh, and that Republicans used to do very well in. You look at all the collar counties outside of Philadelphia, uh, chock full of suburban women, um, and you know those used to be Republican voters, and it's these type of issues that have turned off a lot of those women, and uh, are part of the reason why you saw Rick Santorum so soundly rejected in Pennsylvania in 2006. Hi, uh, Stephen Guy, uh, Wagner class of 2013. Uh, building on the idea of seeing Woody Harrelson do your portrayal, I'm very much interested in seeing Julianne Moore's portrayal of Sarah Palin. So I'd like to bring up the topic of vice presidential picks um, and maybe looking too far into the future, but balancing out uh, the ticket and giving, let's assume Romney gets the nomination. Uh, what would help round out his, his ticket in order to give him the most uh, best option of winning? Um, so I, I think that, you know, and I, I've said this before, uh, you know, I believe um, it was a mistake for us to pick Sarah Palin, uh, not because it wasn't the right thing to do politically. It was a, it was a fact that we were outspent in a race by $250 million. We were in the worst republic environment, you know, that anyone has ever had to run a presidential campaign in. We had four contradictory strategic imperatives uh, that we had to fulfill to try to get traction in the race. We had to excite the middle of the electorate. We had to excite the conservative base of the electorate. We had to show distance from uh, the president, and we needed to show um, we we needed to um, we needed to excite the middle of the electorate. And on paper, 
uh, it seemed great. But at the end of the day, the result was that somebody was nominated to be vice president who was manifestly unprepared to take the oath of office. And I would say from the vice presidential selection process, although the reasons are different, and I don't think that you know, Bob, for example, has the level of responsibility that we have on the McCain campaign, but you know, I think the reality was because his character was revealed later and it was unknowable, you know, each party has nominated John a Edwards candidate about, for yeah. vice president uh, in the last eight years that had no business being anywhere near the, the national command authority. <laughs> it, is a, it, is a, it is a process that is inherently political when the only thing that should be focused on is this person, because they've been called on in American history several times to, to do it, prepared to take the oath of office. Um, it's a process that there should be more transparency around. The press should demand to understand what was the decision-making process, who led that decision-making process, what was the vetting process, what were the discussions that took place between the prospective vice presidential candidate and the presidential candidate. There should be a demand for that vice presidential candidate to appear and answer questions on day one. Uh, I think it's something that we got very, very seriously wrong. It's you know, a story on the vice presidential side, on our side, I think, of, of making assumptions that, well, you have the title governor, and therefore, because you know I've been in politics for a long time, dealing with congressmen and senators and governors, that you have a mean knowledge base that's somewhere here. I actually think that I had not thought and, of this before I heard your uh, impassioned talk there, but there is actually, for all of your students, I think there's either a book or a, 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 a dissertation to be written on the process over the last generation or so, because there are so many great stories there. You've got your situation back in 2004, where Dick Cheney basically created a system where he picked himself. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if yeah. you're going to. Well, you know, in, ten, in, in, two, in 2000, and, you know, it was a, you know, unusual search process. I worked for the vice president. Um, you know, and whatever your view is on, on, on Dick Cheney from a policy perspective or on Joe Biden, these are people who are manifestly qualified to be, right. no question. You know, to be vice president. And Edwards kind of earned his way onto the ticket. Yeah, and he was the, the overwhelming choice of Democrats around the country, and uh, I don't think any of us suspected the, now, Kerry told me something afterwards that I wrote about that if he had told me at the time, the I base. would have shared his big reservation. Uh, you should tell that story. It's interesting. Well, it's, I, I, his, his son had been very tragically uh, killed at the age of 16 in an auto accident. And during his interview with Kerry, he said, told him that he keep in the funeral home, and I, will, I won't describe this in yeah. total vivid detail, but he said to, to his deceased son that he was going to spend the rest of his life trying to make a contribution and really do something in, in honor of Wade. Uh, and he said he was telling Kerry this story and he never told it to anyone before. Problem was he told it to Kerry about two years before. Uh, and this really bothered That'll John. Take, yeah. and, they, and, and he had to go back and have a second interview because in fairness to Kerry, he was very uncomfortable at that point with picking Edwards. And Teresa Hines was really uncomfortable with picking him. Uh, but he was sort of the strong choice of the party. He'd run a good race in the primaries, although he'd lost and lost pretty decisively and early. Uh, and we just made a mistake. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, we should have picked Dick Kephart. He wasn't the exciting choice. It would have made Rupert Murdoch happy because he had a New York Post but that said it's Gephardt. But he made a difference in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, it, would have made a, it could have made a difference in Ohio. And I'll tell you, Missouri is a very strange political culture. It tends to rally around its own, and it might have put Missouri in serious play, but we didn't do it. And uh, the, the, the whole vice presidential thing is, uh, I, to answer the question, I think that the temptation for Romney is going to be to take Karl Rove's view that you can't win the election without 40 percent of the Hispanic vote if you're a Republican, which I think is true, and that gives him the choice of Marco Rubio, who will be, have been in the Senate for two years. Uh, and it's not clear that he connects with the whole span of the Hispanic community. 
Brian Sandoval, who will have been the governor of Nevada for two years, and Susanna Martinez, who will have been the governor of New Mexico for two years. But that's all true, but, it, but it, they do solve, potentially solve a big problem. They, it, it, the, yes, and that's why I think they will be very strongly tempted to move in that direction. I would say the lesson, and I don't think we could have in 2004 have known what ultimately we knew about Kerry. We had, that's about Edwards, Kerry had that small glimpse of it. Uh, I think that the lesson of 2008 is if you're going to pick someone like that, you better spend a long time vetting them. And I don't mean whether or not they paid their taxes. I mean whether or not they know what they're talking about and can handle some of these and big, I, tough issues. I, I, you know, clearly the Hispanic issue is, is, is real sure. in a general election. I wonder, though, if, if it's conceivable that Romney will face something similar to what Kerry faced in 2004. If Rick Santorum keeps on winning other primaries and caucuses, he might, his choices might be very limited. Absolutely. Um, but but I do think again you know the you know the the decision here it's the first presidential decision a candidate makes and it's a decision that the candidate has to make the candidate has to be accountable for making and you know my view is having been around a vice presidential nominee who I don't think should have been the vice presidential nominee in retrospect and around the vice president is that the the singular focus should be, is this person prepared to take the 35-word oath of office should the president become incapacitated? Hi, my name is Sarah Wynn, and I'm a senior in the College of Arts and Science here. I was just wondering about your thoughts on super PACs. Last week, Senator Schumer announced that the Rules Committee would begin hearings on super PACs this month, and he came out against Romney specifically um, and Romney by far has you know, one of the most successful super PACs right now. So I was just wondering on your thoughts about that and the future of super PACs. Well, that was before the president announced his <laughs> <laughs> super PAC, so those, those, those hearings won't be taking place, I suspect. Um, you know, look, I, um, you know, look I, I think, um, you know, I worked for John McCain, and I admire him immensely, um, but I worked for him in spite of his position on campaign finance reform, not because of it. And just because it's called campaign finance reform doesn't mean that it's a good piece of legislation. And the reality is, is what the critics said of the campaign finance reform, McCain-Feingold, was right. We have a First Amendment in this country, and that at the end of the day, all of these efforts to try to take uh, uh, money away from the candidates and the political parties are A, unconstitutional, but B, they have the net effect of destabilizing the political parties. The political parties have been centering organizations and institutions in the country you know, their goal to form a majority. And so we have a campaign finance system now uh, that is moved money out to ideological groups that will increasingly play in both parties' primaries, imposing litmus tests. The money is undisclosed. And so long as the focus remains on trying to take money away from the candidates and money away from the parties, as opposed to putting a focus on instantaneous disclosure, the system is going to get worse and worse and worse. Ever since the campaign finance reform you know, decisions were announced, going back to Buckley v. Uh, Vallejo, you, you have seen a worsening of the system and a corrupting of the, of the process. And aside from you know, the odd congressman who gets caught with 100 grand in their freezer, you know, we basically have eliminated corruption from the system by legalizing it. And so the system, is, the system is fundamentally broken, but I think all of the focus that is on trying to remove money from the system under our system where we have a, a First Amendment to the Constitution and a pretty clear path of Supreme Court precedent is the only thing that you can do here is remove the limits to, can, to candidates and require instantaneous disclosure where the voters can judge. You think that, that sunlight is the best disinfectant? I think it's probably the only way forward. Yeah. Uh, and the super PACs, the president's obviously going to have his own super PAC. It would have been suicidal. Well, he already does. Yeah, but I mean, he's, but they're going to help Ramp raise it money up. for yeah. it. Yeah, because it would have been suicidal not to. You have to play by the rules the way they are. Uh, I largely agree with Steve. I think we need a minimum of campaign finance regulation. I mean, George McGovern told me a story that in the Senate, 
and you know, in the 60s at one point, he was in Estes Kefalver's office, uh, or in, maybe it was in the 50s when he was in the house, but he was visiting Kefalver, and Kefalver opened a drawer and he kept a whole bunch of money in there. And it was people who had given him cash. And he would use it for his campaigns, he would use it to buy a car, he would use it to go to dinner. So <coughs> there, there, the system was incredibly corrupt before we had basic campaign finance reform. But every time we change the law, we have all these unintended consequences. And there was, so what we've done is the parties are powerless or, or, or much less powerful than they used to be. And you know, it'd be a lot better, and I don't know how you get around Citizens United. Romney, if under Steve's plan, could raise the same amount of money that he and his Romney pack are raising. He'd have to take responsibility for all the stuff that was being done. Mm -hmm. And they'd have to disclose the names of the donors. That would be the best place to get. I, I, but, but I have to say, I don't anticipate any progress of any kind on campaign finance reform in the next several years. No, I completely agree with that. Last question. Who's got it? I, I have the mic here. Okay. Um, my name is Alice Labrie, and I'm a Harlem Republican. And I attended a two-day conference at Columbia University on Mormonism. Amazing. And so the question was asked by the moderator of the audience, um, what do we think about the issue of Mr. Romney's religion? I am supporting Mr. Romney. And I said, I didn't care if you worship a caterpillar with orange stripes as long as you don't impose it on me. And I liked his saying, I'm not running as pastor of the country, but the president. So what are your comments about the uh, religious issue? Well, as, as I said earlier, I, I've been, I think that that um, argument made by Mitt Romney has, has, pretty, has prevailed for the most part. I think there's been uh, very, you know, it seems to me, very little opposition to him based on uh, his religion. And there hasn't seemed, you know, I can speak among my colleagues in the press, all that much interest, at least to date, in pressing it uh, either. I think people basically think, you know, yes, as long as you are not going to rule the country or, or ask the church to make the decision only a president can make, uh, it's, it's not really our business. Yeah, I, 1960 was a fundamental watershed, I think, for America. Uh, Joe Lieberman's nomination, whatever you think of him in other ways, was another step forward for America. Uh, and I think it would be a terrible step backwards if Romney's Mormonism became an issue in this campaign. I think it would be, it, it would be bad for the country. Uh, it would, it would set us back in ways that are really fundamental. I, f I feel the same way, for example, about the whole issue of choice and what's happening there. Uh, that we could go backwards in a lot of different ways, and I don't want to see us go backwards. Yeah, I, I think that the arc of the country is towards freedom and justice and inclusion, and I don't think this will be a big issue. I think that to the extent that people try to raise it, it will backfire on them. Uh, that's not to say that in some states, some people will not vote for him. I think that it's probably more acute in a primary, a Republican primary, than it is in a general election. Um, just like there were people who wouldn't vote for Barack Obama because he was African American. But I think that every year that we go forward, the number of people who make decisions like that shrinks in the country. And on that note, thank you all very much for coming out. Thanks for being here.